so I hope you forgive me my small revolution from before. Um, and um, now that I, that I will officially begin with my presentation, I first would like to thank you uh, for the invitation. I have to say that I'm very happy to be here with you. It is the third time I come in the last uh, two years. And uh, every time your city, Cairo, is growing in my heart, and uh, I really feel very well here. And you see, this this was a children that came to me asking, "What's your name? How are you? Uh, have I was in Alazar Park?" And uh, it it makes it really very pleasant to be here. Uh, before we saw that resilience is about adaptation, but resilience is about resources. And I think this small uh, drawing show it uh, very well. Um, what do you mean? Since how long do we know that the resources are exhaustible? Since how long? Are we conscious about that? 50 years? 50 years? Even more. But thank you for the answer. Um, there is a president of the United States of America who said to the Congress, optimism is a good characteristic, but if carried to an excess, it becomes foolishness. We are prone to speak of the resources of this country as inexhaustible. This is not the case. The mineral wealth of the country, the coal, iron, oil, gas, and the like, doesn't reproduce itself and therefore is certain to be exhausted and activated ultimately, and wastefulness in dealing with it today means that our descendants will feel the exhaustion a generation or two before they are otherwise would. Which president of the United States was that? I helped you, it was not Obama yesterday. <laughs> Who? Abe Lincoln. <laughs> Nearly, it was Theodore Roosevelt in uh, um, 1907, so for more than one century. And I think this is a paradox of the United States. I, the first whistleblowers came from the US, uh, but US has still the biggest footprint in the world. Uh, resilience is also about holistic approach, and I'm very happy that um, in those two days so many people spoke about holistic approach because I was in France, I guess, one of the first who spoke about that uh, 10 years ago. Um, resilience um, and uh, when resilience is about uh, resources, I see um, four. Four kinds. I'm sorry, it's, in, uh, it's in, in French. I see the site, I see the materials, I see the energy, and I also see the human. And uh, the holistic approach deals um, with the connection of all those, um, those points. And we will look at a few uh, case studies where, uh, where we will see those four issues. Uh, this is one of the most well-known sustainable building in, um, in Europe. It was built from Hermann Kaufmann, a very uh, famous um, Austrian architect who won the first global award of sustainable architecture 2007. Uh, so if we take always our four issues, uh, the human here, it's 10 years of participatory process and also a public-private use. Uh, in this uh, building, which is really in becoming the heart uh, of the village, because the village had no uh, square in the middle, uh, like it is uh, very often the case in Vorarlberg, then you see uh, this is uh, a cafe with restaurant, uh, this is a meeting room, uh, this is a library, this is a kindergarten, these are uh, uh, offices which are rented, this is a post office, and uh, on the level, um, over, uh, so the first level, there, um, there is a um, town hall. 
so really private public uh, functions uh, together. Concerning the energy, this um, building is passive house. Uh, it means that it needs uh, less, so uh, about 13 kilowatt hour uh, for quadrat uh, square meters and here for heating. They heat with wood. It is a central uh, heating for the community and uh, 7.5 kilowatt hour for cooling with ground water. And as you see in the pictures, they, they have covered the square with photovoltaic, which brings uh, about half the need uh, for, for energy. Concerning the materials now, they need uh, about 220 square meters of wood. It is their own wood coming from the community and uh, wool, uh, wool for the installation. So uh, this building has half of uh, embodied energy than a normal building. Uh, concerning the cost, it's in interesting that the additional costs are about 2% for the sustainable materials and 8% for uh, the energy, uh, uh, including photovoltaic, which makes uh, most of the 8%. Interesting is um, that in this small region, uh, Vorarlberg in, uh, in Austria, uh, this is the entrance of the, of the library. Uh, I buy in the village and I make soft mobility. And uh, this is in the kindergarten of, uh, of this um, community center and it's called Safe Energy. So you see they begin uh, very early, so good habits are teach very early, and uh, we already spoke uh, many times of about education in the last uh, two days. Uh, the second case study is also in Vorarlberg in Austria, uh, but it is housing. Uh, the site it is an industrial waste, so we are building the city on the city, so trying not um, to use new land. Uh, concerning the site, there is also soft mobility, so they chose the site uh, that they were able to go in 15 minutes with the bus or with uh, um, uh, the bicycle. There was a bicycle lane uh, nearby to, to the center of the city and also to the Constance Lake. And uh, concerning the materials, the contractor uh, has a firm for concrete, but then he is, he, he is really very aware that first concrete needs a lot of embodied energy and also uh, that granulate are becoming very, very scarce. So that's the reason uh, why he tries uh, to use uh, other materials. So um, you will see here, uh, they built out of concrete um, because to have a ceiling out of concrete, it is quite uh, convenient uh, for the fire, for the acoustic, uh, and also it brings uh, inertia mass, thermal mass, but all the walls are made out of uh, wood. Um, concerning energy, it is a passive house uh, building, and also they uh, try to raise awareness and they help with ITEC. In this building, uh, you see when they come in the building, they say, uh, I come, and they say, I go, and everything is closed, or everything uh, um, um, for all the energy uh, are, uh, are opened. So it is a way uh, not to go out of the buildings with, uh, with light on. Uh, concerning the human, uh, the contractor was also very concerned about offering uh, to the people an alternative, uh, attractive alternative to, uh, to a one family house, uh, which everyone wants in, uh, in Europe. I think uh, 85% of the people in Austria want to have a one family house. So, how to make uh, collective housing, residential housing, uh, attractive. And uh, they, one of the points that they uh, analyzed to, together with the architects was to say, okay, we will make a free plateau, and like for the offices, and when you have free plateaus, you can organize the, um, the plan as you want. So this is one possibility to organize a plan, but because the fluids are only in five points, 
the people could buy this piece of um, of the flat or this one or this one. Everything was was open. They could really choose uh, what they wanted. And then the architect uh, developed um, a method that he calls conscious conception. He first uh, tried it uh, 20 years long in one family houses and it was the first time he tried that with a collective housing. And uh, he make kind of, um, so he asked people, uh, so the, 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 the clients, what they really, really need. And uh, in a few uh, meeting with them, he, um, he can define very uh, precisely what the people really want and uh, it is amazing to see the result. So here you see a few uh, propositions. Um, I, um, I had the possibility to uh, ask people who made clients who made that with, with him, and uh, I, I made them, so this is a, a contractor, this is uh, the architect, and these are the clients. Uh, I wouldn't like to live in this apartment, but the, the, the couple was so happy with that that they say we could never have to uh, think that uh, an architect could find uh, something which is so convenient for us. And I think that resilience uh, is also um, to be able to find what people really need and uh, also uh, with this uh, free plateau uh, they can change uh, the apartment when they want. As first uh, case study, this is in France, but it is it's the France in the tropics. Uh, it's near Madagascar. It is refurbishing an informal settlement in La Réunion. So this is what it was before. What it is now, it is uh, keeping the people in their old area in order not to uproot uh, them. And uh, the people participated uh, to the construction of, uh, of their home and uh, were really very, uh, very happy with, with that. And uh, as you see, they naturally uh, are using the sand to warm the water. The materials, wood stones, and the traditional shape of Casa Terra, what is a traditional vernacular building there. Um, this is something that I ask to my students when they make um, an analysis of a, a building. I always ask them what is the proportion uh, between low tech and high tech in this building. And all, I also ask them this building, uh, how is the proportion of ecology, social, culture, and economy? Uh, because I think it is very important to be aware that uh, sustainability um, is uh, with those four factors, also the, the cultural one. Um, so this is uh, a passive house, but it is not sustainable architecture in my eyes. Why isn't it sustainable architecture? No idea. I will have oh. <laughs> because it is not architecture. Um, and uh, we, we are coming to the, to the fourth uh, case uh, study, uh, which is, uh, I find, a wonderful uh, building. Uh, this morning uh, we have seen uh, projects with which, uh, so an architect was won the um, uh, Agakan Award, so this was Agakan Award 2007, and it was given to a very young woman uh, Anna Hiria, and uh, now she is 34, but when she got the award, she was about 27, and it was the project that she has done for her diploma. So they are people which have really a lot of talent. And uh, the thing that Anna wants to do is to prove that also with few resources, it is possible to create beauty and to increase identity in uh, rural areas. Beauty is not a privilege for the which is a sentence that Anna uh, very often uh, says. When she uh, designed this, this school, um, she um, asked herself 
uh, what were her dreams uh, when she was a child? What were your dreams when you were a child? What were the places where you wanted to be? Or where you wanted to go to the school? You had no dreams. Um, Anna had two dreams. One dream was uh, like a cabin in the, in the trees, and the other one was like uh, a cave. And so that's what she has done for the children. She has done for them a cave, where they can be protected, uh, and she has done um, a cabin in the, not in the tree in this case. Uh, she planted uh, plants here, so that it is also in the green, but uh, she explained that the goats always came and ate the vegetation, so it, is, it, is, uh, it could never be uh, a cabin in, in, in the green. But um, you see, this is um, the, this kind of, of case where the children can go the way when they are finished with their work and where they can uh, have a rest or discuss in a small group. This building is also very interesting concerning the energy because uh, she has proposed two strategies for a comfortable uh, school. The first strategy is that it is in, in Bangladesh, so it is quite, uh, quite hot, and uh, once, uh, when you have a hot climate, uh, one strategy is to have very thick walls. And uh, so she has very thick health walls, about 50 centimeters thick, and the thermal mass, uh, also the mass of the cave, cave uh, keep uh, the room uh, quite uh, comfortable. And the second um, strategy is this one, is the natural ventilation. That's why it is open on, on both sides and then the wind can, can come. Um, Anna also tries to, um, to use um, local materials and uh, she also tries to, um, to make uh, more valuable uh, things that the uh, people produce uh, in the village like uh, the sari uh, tissues were here uh, used for the ceiling and uh, for um, um, kind of shutters. Materials, it's cob. Cob is made out of earth and, uh, and straw and, uh, and bamboo. Both were taken around a few hundred meters uh, around, the, around the side. Uh, what is in, in very interesting in this building is that um, it is low-tech materials, but it is high design. For instance, uh, to calculate uh, these uh, bamboo beams, um, Anna worked with the uh, um, Technical University in Munich, and uh, they ex yeah, so they tried to, to to look if they needed three bamboos or four bamboos, and uh, how often they how often they needed to put uh, a metal element, vertical metal element and uh, how to, um, to, to make all those, uh, those choices. So low-tech materials, but uh, I design. And I think it is perhaps one thing that uh, uh, Occidental countries, something like Europe, Germany, could bring uh, to the Egyptian um, people or to many countries, not to, to sell the materials, but to help with uh, know-how and high technology, high design. Um, then this school is a handmade school also for children and for women. I mean that also the, the children participated to do that, to, to, to do this school, and naturally, uh, oh, not, not very naturally, but the women too. At the beginning, uh, it is uh, to build, it's something for the men. But uh, Anna wanted to involve also the, the women, and they, they, she proposed them to do something that they very often do uh, in, um, in Africa, is uh, to make the plastering. What was the next, the next step in this small uh, village in Bangladesh is that uh, they have built a second school, but this 
the school for uh, people who learned uh, to be elect electrician, and uh, and also uh, a few people have built their own house, and uh, they have built their own house not with only one level, what is normal, but with two levels, and the the idea is that. Uh, when you have the same ground, instead of having the house on the whole ground, you have uh, the house on half the ground, but on two levels, and in the ground which is left, you can grow vegetables, uh, which can first give you things uh, to eat for your family, but also um, to, to sell and to give more income. Um, interesting is also, and if you if you have a look at the, at the picture, you see that it is not makeshift job. It is really very precise job and it is also something perhaps that um, occidental specialists can, can bring to many countries is to uh, work very accu accurate and uh, to use old, um, uh, old materials with modern technology. This is a, a sentence from Anna that I like very much. Architecture is a tool to improve life. Um, you can go to her website. I think you will see also the other buildings that she has done. Um, yesterday there was a question, is or can be uh, Earth architecture modern? Uh, Martin Howe, who is a specialist for Grand Earth, who always worked with uh, Anna Heringer, he was one of the speakers last year, uh, made his own house in Austria, out of Earth, Grand Earth, on three levels, and uh, he took the, the Earth directly from the, from the side. And if I show, uh, show you this house, it is because yesterday there was a question, uh, is it possible to make uh, a sanitary, so to, to make toilets and so on in a health house, naturally. So this is uh, the um, uh, kitchen of uh, Martin House house, uh, and this is one of the um, um, bathrooms. Uh, this is... Uh, also uh, made from Martin Rauch uh, out of Earth. And uh, this is the second, um, the second bathroom. So you can um, have a bathroom in a Earth house. It's really no problem. You can have it with uh, the best standards, European standards. And uh, in Bangladesh, in the uh, project I showed you before, there are also uh, bathrooms. And now what about Egypt? What is the main issue here? Uh, it is to give to the poor a better life. Decent homes, education, work. This is also already what Hassan Fatih tries to do in the 40s, 50s. Uh, we all know that he failed and he explained also in this book why he failed. But he has a very, very important uh, um, transmission, and uh, there are many architects in Europe who really are, have a, a, a huge admiration for his, his work, and uh, you can also find this kind of couples uh, of roles uh, in Germany made from uh, students uh, of Hassan Fatih. Uh, I had the luck uh, two days ago to, to visit uh, an apartment from Asal Fatih here in Cairo and uh, it was built around uh, 65 and uh, I, it is one of the nicest apartments that I've ever seen. Uh, you are on the top of a, a building with seven levels perhaps and uh, you feel like in a house in the middle of, of Cairo and it has all the elements uh, which give you uh, a bioclimatical uh, architecture. I mean that you have you are comfortable uh, without climatization, so without air conditioning and you just uh, feel well there. Um, I think it fits very well to a sentence from Gustav Mahler the tradition is a transmission of the flame, not the worship of the ash. There is also, uh, there are in, in Cairo um, many, um, but not many, but a few projects trying to make this balance between uh, 
tradition and modernity. There is the one uh, uh, for old Cairo. There is also the conservation and revitalization of Dar al Hama, so uh, at the bottom of Al Azhar Park. Uh, there will be on November the 1st, so this, uh, this year, in a few weeks, uh, the lightening of uh, the Zeppelin. It is made from Foundation, Foundation Locus together with uh, Studio Mumbai, and uh, I think it will be certainly a very interesting thing to, to discover. Uh, also, in rural areas, you can make social housing, in this case, out of uh, stone. And there is also naturally, naturally the example of Sekem, uh, which is an alternative model for agriculture and industry. Uh, one of the former speakers spoke about making organic jam and so on. This is the kinds of things that they make at Sekem, but they don't do only that, they also uh, make uh, cotton. And with those cotton, they make um, uh, clothes, especially baby clothes that you can find in Germany and my children uh, had this kind of clothes uh, without that I knew that it was made in second. And um, now I, I'm not Obama but I, I made a dream. I visited the, uh, the day before yesterday, so on Sunday, I visited al -Asal. sorry I don't pronounce it uh, fine, so as I should. Mohammed, but I, I hope you forgive me. Um, and uh, I was I was quite shocked uh, to see the conditions in which the people are, are living there. Uh, I was also shocked to see that there was so few craftsmanship. But I saw this one with uh, palm uh, midriffs, and we have seen this morning that with palm midriffs it is possible to make a lot of things. Um, the architect, uh, Egyptian architect Moussa Sakaria is now working on the refurbishing of this um, area. And uh, when I walked along, I, I saw the marketplace of, of this area. Uh, this is how it looks uh, from the street. This is how it looks uh, inside. And my dream is that uh, our students the students from the USD uh, works together uh, first to make a design for a new marketplace and then build it uh, with um, perhaps a French carpenter, if I decide him, uh, to come and also with uh, the um, teachers, the professors here, and perhaps with a few people from uh, the area. I think this is the kind of and on uh, workshop, and on projects that we really need to change the things. It is possible to build things with uh, students. Uh, a few students who are here, like, like Nahla or Mona, have built this together with a group of French uh, students. It is out of earth and, uh, and wood, and it is a summer kitchen uh, for uh, uh, um, the experimental part of the University of uh, Lyon and Grenoble. You can even make uh, with people who never built before uh, this kind of church. Uh, this is a carpenter I will try to, to get to, to Cairo who, done, who has done it uh, two years ago with 20 people. I think it's just possible when we want it and when we decide to do that. Um, today, there is a necessary revolution for us. And uh, the question is how individuals and organizations are working together to create a sustainable world. Climate changes, degradation of natural environment and finiteness of resources call for a change of paradigm. We have seen that here in Egypt you are able to make a revolution. You could perhaps make another one concerning architecture, sustainable architecture and urban planning. And as conclusion, the holistic approach is an open process based on the mutual trust, the share of knowledge, the collective intelligence, the search for beauty. I think it is a very important point that too few people are speaking about 
is a pleasure to work together and the creative empathy. Um, to build sustainable, you need to learn techniques. You need to learn how to build with earth, how to build with wood. You need to learn how to save energy. But essential is the human being, not the technique. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thanks to me for uh, explaining more about the market crypto side because today, uh, uh, yesterday I was so happy uh, when, you when you mentioned that uh, there is a carpenter who would come and work with the students, but it never crossed my mind with a French carpenter. Uh, I thought that um, by doing that exercise, you definitely should rely on local expertise. I mean, um, uh, trying to get a French carpenter who has it's like being been also busy in Cameroon <laughs> uh, to come and work on a um, uh, marketplace uh, in Cairo in a former area. From my view, is not a very resilient solution. Um, I recall the uh, experience of Asad Nani. I don't know if you heard about him or not. Asad is a professor at the AUC. Uh, he is a founder. He is actually the mentor of the Dabul Ahmad Innovation Program. And he was also one of the pioneers in um, uh, taking care of this carpenting uh, business. Uh, he, uh, I think during the 60s, he found two uh, remaining uh, Ma'alian, uh, master uh, craftsmen, uh, of uh, working with furniture. And based on these two, he started teaching other generations. Now he has a huge business uh, when it comes to uh, uh, furniture, uh, but it's not only a business, it's a very resilient business because it's based on the community of those craftsmen, locally um, um, found and then um, um, put in a system that makes, makes sure that the uh, knowledge and know-how is being transferred from one generation to another. Um, so maybe I would ask you to kindly reconsider uh, uh, sure, because yeah. yesterday, <laughs> yes, yesterday you didn't tell me that you have carpenters. I am not expecting to be French, but I am naturally I'm very happy if you have carpenter, and uh, it was my plan B uh, in case we don't find uh, people here. But if you t tell me that uh, there are people here, it's, it's naturally much much better. And uh, my uh, French carpenter doesn't speak Arabic. <laughs> Mine does not speak French as well. <laughs> it was uh, a very nice initiative from GIZ uh, three years ago uh, to have a project called Open Doors uh, for Texture Melo. And uh, the idea was really brilliant to bring four countries carpenters and every group of carpenters to develop and produce and actually manufacturing uh, a door from their culture. And actually to do to put this all in a, in a booth, a very nice one, we need to enter from culture to the other culture through these doors. And then uh, also fully agree with uh, Muhammad about the about the idea of having the local carpenters. But uh, also, if we really joining uh, uh, these activities with other carpenters from uh, from France, from Germany, it would be great because the uh, to interlock uh, craftsmanship uh, knowledge is really uh, can can go out. I I was with uh, with this carpenter, this French carpenter last year in Brazil in. Uh, um, in a small village, uh, because it is a, a village where the carpentry is going uh, going down, and uh, we we wanted with a, a group of architects to um, to help them to yes, just just to show 
also to the locals that they are important. And uh, there was a, a moment which was very full of emotion uh, when uh, our uh, so my so, so the French carpenter came to uh, a local carpenter. The local carpenter gave him his tool so that he could work on something that he was doing. And it was really important for this Brazilian carpenter to be recognized. So they, they, they just, without being able to speak the same language, they re recognize each other and they have this respect. So um, it, perhaps both uh, could, be, could be interesting. Uh, maybe I just add to Wilde's uh, remarks about uh, the open door. And since 10 years I'm dreaming and promoting a school of skill of uh, traditional material and traditional skill work in Egypt. And we have chosen already a madrasa in uh, medieval Cairo. Maybe I can hand it over to you to follow up it, because there is a cooperation with the German Center of Skill Work in Fulda. They have this training for mud brick, all these things, and they are willing to cooperate, but it was always a problem. Uh, but it was actually at the beginning financed by Baden-Württemberg, but then the lack of money, unfortunately, was uh, killing this project. But maybe this is something for, for training architects, uh, craftsmen in this traditional material, traditional way of uh, work uh, to do this. So I have a proposal, I think 100 papers, I can hand it over to you, maybe you <laughs> Come to Nant. Good <laughs> fine. Uh, concerning the uh, putting people together, I uh, I teach. I, I used to teach uh, at the engineer uh, wood engineer uh, school in Epinal in uh, in France, and uh, since five or six years, we make every year uh, what we call Défi du Bois, so wood challenge. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and so they are uh, the the 25 students from this whole wood master, and uh, 25 students coming from all over the world. And during one week, they build something together in 10 groups of five students, and it is just incredible to see what those uh, they they are half architect, half engineers, what what they what they do in uh, w within one one week. And, uh, and it is really a way uh, to, to put young people together. And uh, when I asked my students uh, what, were the, what was the most important, the, the nicest moment uh, during your, your studies, they always say the, the one week at the Défi du Bois. So um, I think it is really important that our students don't always think and uh, dream with theories but also that they, that, that they touch the materials, that they work the materials. It's also really a way that, that they, as I told yesterday, that they give more respect to the craft, craftsmen. <laughs> Any other question? Brian, do you want to, to close the session? Uh, actually, I find uh, I find your proposal because uh, when you started uh, um, also uh, like proposing to have it in a different way, uh, it was really a nice move. Uh, th thank you for for our uh, lectures. Uh, it, uh, it was really honored to have this session with you. Also, uh, I think I thank uh, Mohammed and uh, the program really inviting us to. Uh, to, to have this uh, very nice uh, opportunity to talk about uh, the subject. Uh, actually, uh, it would be great to have like, an action on the ground, so I really to agree with, uh, with Dominique in, uh, in having a project. Um, uh, it would be uh, uh, more learning uh, to do it together, uh, so I'm really uh, pushing this as well. Thank you.